Hi guys. Today we're going to be doing Jeremiah chapter 5. And so we're going to go ahead and open up in prayer. Lord Jesus, we adore you. We thank you and we worship you. We invite you into this study. We ask that you would take control. Anoint our minds to receive what you have for us today. Enlighten the eyes of our understanding so that we can understand and know and receive what you have for us. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. Jeremiah 5, starting with verse 1. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if you can find a man, if there be any that executes judgment and seeks the truth and I will pardon it. So God is presenting a challenge um, here um, to Jeremiah, to the people, to go and look and see if there's one person, he said, that's executing judgment, that's just doing, performing what's right. So you got to um, really look at context and different things. A lot of times when the word judgment is used in the King James it's actually referring to just making justice. So a lot of times judgment, we it may have a negative connotation because of what we've made it become. But any type of like, um, you know, obviously we most know it from a judge. So a judgment is just a right verdict. God is calling for the truth, for justice to be met. Because even in a trial, when someone is found not guilty, that's still a judgment that was given. Guilty and not guilty are the two different judgments that can be given. It's just the final end result of justice. So we have a negative connotation on the word judgment, but there really shouldn't be any because judgment is good and judgment is fine. Even in the New Testament, we are commanded by Jesus to judge righteously. And so there's no problem with judging the problem what we're really confusing it with is condemnation, condemning someone for something that they're doing. That's the real word people are wanting to use when they, you know, don't judge me. Um, they don't condemn me is actually the judge is the wrong word to use because we judge everything. We judge, you know, um, we judge the fact that flip flops aren't appropriate attire in a snowstorm. We judge if we have enough room in a lane to move over. We judge how hungry we are or what we're going to eat. Those are all judgments, you know, that we make be, we make decisions based on what's presented to us and we come up with a judgment. That's really what all a judgment is. So God is asking Jeremiah, presenting this challenge, go and see if you can find anyone that's actually looking for the truth. And the sad state about this that I realized it when I was reading over this chapter is, you know, we have back in Genesis when Abraham was making this challenge with God, when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he kept saying, if you find 50 righteous, well, just what about five minus 50? And he kept going down and bargaining with God. Got all the way down to like five or 10 righteous. And God said, for their sake, I won't destroy it if you can find five or 10 righteous and they couldn't. And we're like, oh my goodness, how horrible. What a sad state of affairs when you have these two cities and you can't five, find five good people in it. But here we have God's own people and you can't find one, not one. Verse two, and though they say the Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. So again, we've been talking about that Um the way these people were, and we see that a lot today. People sitting on a pew in church and their heart could not be further from God. They're just going through the motions, punching in their religious time card and going through the motions. And unfortunately, they can fool a lot of people. They don't fool God. Verse 3, O Lord, are not your eyes upon the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, 
but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They refuse to return. So God sends correction to them, sends judgment to them, and punishes their misdeeds, and they still won't stop. Verse 4, therefore I said, surely these are poor. They are foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. I will get me to the great men. Okay, can't reach these regular people. I'm going to go to the higher ups, those that are well known and have this higher education and have studied the law of the Lord. I'm going to go look to them. I will get me to the great men and will speak to them. For they have known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst their bonds. So they, even the ones that should have known better, didn't act any better. Verse 6, therefore a lion out of the forest will kill them. And a wolf of the evening will spoil them. A leopard shall watch over their cities. Everyone that goes out there will be torn in pieces. Because their transgressions are many and their backslidings are increased. How shall I pardon you for this? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by them that are no gods. When I had fed them to the full, they committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops to the harlot's house. So God went, did all these things for them, and they spit in his face, went off, sleeping around, going to other gods. Verse 8, they were as fed horses in the morning, everyone neighing after his neighbor's wife. Everybody sleeping with everybody. Shall I not visit them for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? And if God wants his soul avenged for such a nation as that, What must be awaiting our nation today? Verse 10, go ye up upon her walls and destroy, but make not a full end. Take away her battlements, for they are not the Lord's. That's pretty strong. They are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. So I looked this up because you actually find this word a lot, treacherously. That is used a lot. It's used often in Jeremiah. Um, It's even used in Malachi. And um, God was rebuking the husbands for how they were treating their wives, saying they dealt very treacherously with the wife of their youth. And so... I wanted to look this up and I I want to encourage you when you're reading scripture to not only look up the original text, um, the Hebrew um, lexicons and see what the real meanings were, but even basic words that you think you know, I want you to look them up because there will be other definitions that you didn't even know about and this is an excellent case. So when we hear the word treacherous, We think of awful, just awful, horrible, maybe torture, maybe violence, treacherous. And that's actually not at all what this word means in the Hebrew even and in this situation. And if you look it up in the dictionary, that definition of something being horribly awful is actually like third or fourth down. It's not even the main definition of the word. The main definition of the word in the dictionary is actually what it is talking about in the Hebrew. And it means deceit. Deceitfully. Trickery. 
In fact, treacherous comes from a Hebrew word that means to cover with a garment, to hide, to conceal, to sneak, to be deceitful. That's what they were doing to God. Remember we talked about acting the part, lifting their hands, praising God in their heart. It was just evil and awful. They dealt with manipulation, all kinds of things. 12, they have belied the Lord and said, it is not he. God's not the one who brought all this trouble on us. Neither shall evil come to us. Neither will we see sword or famine. God's going to protect us. We're not going to have anything to worry about. He's not going to punish us. I think in um, Ecclesiastes, I could be wrong about this, but there's a scripture that talks about um, because punishment for a sin isn't done right away, people keep on doing it. And that's what this is. Like, oh, okay, because we've gotten away with it for so long. I've gotten away with manipulating people and lying and everybody falling for my act. So I'm going to keep doing it. That's only going to work for so long. Verse 13, and the prophets shall become wind. Just full of hot air, as they say. And the word is not in them. Thus shall it be done to them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it will devour them. So he's talking to Jeremiah. He's saying, I'm going to make your words like fire, and these people like wood, and it's going to tear them up. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you, from far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you don't know, neither understand what they say. Now that's awful. Not only to be taken captive, to be led away as slaves, but by a foreign country, you don't know what they're saying. That would just be on just worse. You don't understand what's going on. You don't know what they're talking about. You don't know what they're plotting, what they're saying. You don't understand anything. Verse 16, their quiver is as an open tomb. They are all mighty men. And they will eat up your harvest and your bread that your sons and daughters should have eaten. So your children are going to starve while they sit there and feed their faces on your kids' food because of what you did. They shall eat up thy flocks and thy herds. They shall eat up your vines, your fig trees. They shall impoverish thy fenced cities wherein you trusted with the sword. So that's what happens when we leave God. And we go after other things and we trust in other things, maybe ourself. Maybe um, we can get by for so long on conning people and conniving and manipulating. And so we trust on our own selves to get ourselves out of situations by using people to promote us, to get out of situations, swindling money out of people, conning them to do stuff for us, whatever it is. And so we've learned to just depend on ourselves, whatever it is, when we leave God and we depend on other means to get by, God is going to take those things away and we'll be left with nothing. Verse 18. Nevertheless, in those days, saith the Lord, I will not make a full end of you. And it shall come to pass when ye shall say, Why does the Lord our God do all these things to us? Then shalt thou answer them, Like as you have forsaken me and served strange gods in your land, so shall you serve strangers in a land that is not yours. Declare this in the house of Jacob and publish it in Judah, saying, Hear now this, O foolish people, without understanding, that have eyes and you can't even see, ears and you don't even listen. 
Will you not fear me, saith the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for a boundary of the sea by a perpetual decree, and it cannot pass it? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over it. But this people has a revolting and rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither do they say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God. He's the one who gives us rain, the former and the latter in its season. He reserves to us the appointed weeks of the harvest. No one even stops to consider, hey, God's the one who brought us this far. Maybe we should turn to him. Maybe we should thank him. Maybe we should follow him. Verse 25, your iniquities have turned away these things and your sins have withheld good things from you. For among my people are found wicked men and they lay wait like those who are set in traps. They set a trap and catch people. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they are become great and waxen rich. So they got all this money off of swindling, conniving, using other people. Has made them the money and the life that they wanted by conning other people. They have grown fat. They shine. Yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. Your, God's own people became worse. And the heathen. And I looked this up when it says they are grown fat, they shine. Um, shine comes from the Hebrew word that means um, chic or slick. They're slick. Deceiving. You know, like um, almost like black ice, you don't even know what's coming. And you know, you're just walking and you think it looks it looks one way to you till you take a step and can cause great damage. You fall, lose your balance, and you're going down. So God's people are worse than the wicked. They judge not the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy, they do not judge. They don't care about poor people. They don't care about people who need justice in different situations. All they care about is getting richer. We can relate a lot to that. Verse 29, Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on a nation such as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. And when it says wonderful, it's not the wonderful we think of. Full of wonder, full of awe, like you're, are you serious right now? Devastation. Okay, a devastating and horrible thing is committed in the land. The next and last verse tells us what that devastating, horrible thing is. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it this way. But what will you do in the end? All the stuff that you're trusting in, when it's stripped away from you, and you have nothing left but the unrelenting judgment of God poured out upon your life, what are you going to do then? Are you going to still harden your heart? Are you still going to fight? Are you still going to run? Are you going to surrender? It's very important what he talked about here. The prophets prophesy lies. And the priests bear rule by their means. So the spiritual leaders get control over the people. Use what they can to just control and manipulate people. And it's so sad because you see today so many pastors
I was part of an organization that was a is to this day is a cult. And I was part of it for over 20 years till gratefully the Lord opened my eyes and brought me out. Um, it was a tremendous hell. And the worst part about it is because they have a lot of truth. And so you can do a lot, and that's the deceit of the devil too. And that whole manipulation in the spirit of Jezebel, when you mix in the truth with some lies, then it seems right. And you start to question yourself and not second guess yourself and just such manipulation, gaslighting. So many of them are classic narcissists. And the sad thing about it is this. We talked about in these last couple chapters of Jeremiah, we've been seeing this common theme being repeated that the people have turned away from God while acting like they're saved and believing that they're saved and claiming to be saved. But their hearts are the furthest thing from God and their leaders doing the same. Prophets, prophets lying and the pastors. That's why at one part we read where um, God said, I will give you pastors after my own heart. I'm going to give you better ones because these dudes are gone. And we see what it is that they do it by rule, by authority, by force, by manipulation, by beating submission into you. And so they'll focus on those verses in the New Testament. Um, obey them that bear the rule over you when that's not even what the Greek says. That is the deception of people that has been poured out upon us. That's not even what the verse says. You look in the original Greek and it's submit to them that lead you, not bear rule. But them pastors sure love that verbiage, don't they? Yep. I'm going to rule. And that's what they do. They go and they set up their own little kingdom. That's why all their friends and family are in the leadership positions. It's not about who's called. It's about who they know. And that's what they do. It's sick. They will remove people from positions that God anointed to be there so they can put one of their family members in it. All this stuff. That's what they're doing. They're building their own little kingdom. It has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. But they'll tell you just like we're reading in Jeremiah. And this is the scariest thing um, that what we've been going over, the sad irony. Um, the last pastor that I had in that cult um, he actually stood up there in the pulpit one day and made a joke and was laughing at people who claim to hear from God, that God speaks to them. Um, if there's a time that they, um, you know, randomly, maybe they've been praying and asking God for something and then they go um, and they randomly open up their Bible and they look and it's, the answer that they've been, and God speaks to them. So he was laughing, saying, that does not happen. Um, that's always happened to me. In fact, when I was new in the Lord and I didn't know one verse from another, that's how God reached me when I was a lost, broken young woman. I was, uh, my family cut me off when I came to the Lord um, because I dared want better for myself. And, um, and so I was scared. I didn't know nothing. And right in that moment, I, I was hopeless and I thought, I, I guess I'm supposed to read the Bible, but I don't know. I don't know anything. And it just the tension and the stress was building up. And I'm like, whatever. And I half-hearted opened my Bible. And when my eyes hit the page, it was a verse that I needed. God met me there. And here now I have this pastor standing in a pulpit, bearing rule by his means, laughing at people who claim to hear from God that way. And he's like, I tried it once before. Yeah, and I closed my eyes and, and asked, yeah, I'll lead me and opened it up. And <laughs> I looked and it was a scripture. Oh, my bowels, my bowels. Oh, yeah. And he just made a joke about it. Here's the irony. Well, number one, if you don't believe in it, God's not going to speak to you that way anyway. If you're going into something and you are doing it in a mocking way and you don't really believe in it, why would God honor it? Secondly, God had spoken to him, but he was so calloused and cold and evil in his heart 
that he didn't even know. Because that verse we just read yesterday in chapter 4. That was when Jeremiah, because the words are different now in the King James, and that's when his whole body was torn up and just he was sick to his stomach. His heart bows meant your torso. So his heart, his chest hurt, his, all of his insides because he saw the state of the people that the pastors were perverted and the people turned away from God. So here is this pastor saying, yeah, the, my balls, my balls, and didn't even know God was speaking right to him that his heart was evil and he was away from God and he laughed it off. And he will claim that he is the one with the truth. Just like these people. When you have the audacity, the nerve, and the guts to stand up in a pulpit, in a place of leadership, and proclaim how God is allowed or isn't allowed to speak to people, you are so arrogant so arrogant that it is devastating and horrible and disgusting according to the word of God. So may we all as his people take an honest, honest look in our heart and see are we really people of God? Or are we deceiving ourselves? That's the issue with deceiving. You don't know you're deceived. So let's take an honest look and pray and seek God's face to find out, is this really true? Am I a man of God, a woman of God? Am I following God correctly with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength? And if not, May we repent and change our lives back on track, come back to the Father, surrender ourselves, humble ourselves, and not be hard as a rock, but soft in the potter's hands. Hallelujah. I pray that this blesses you and that you have a great night. Thank you so much for joining me today. Bye-bye.